good to be with you today. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, sagebrush canopy reduction uh, projects and considerations in, in light of sage grouse, uh, particularly sage grouse habitat. Uh, my name's uh, Dave Dahlgren. I'm a, a range and wildlife extension specialist uh, here at Utah State University. So I wanted to start out this by talking a little bit about professional or educational bias. And what I mean by this is if, if we were all together in a room, I would, I would ask for hands raised here. But when you look at this photo, what do you see? So as a wildlife biologist, um, you know, I'm looking at this and I'm seeing habitat. I'm seeing uh, certain cover height and uh, certain canopy cover and in the riparian area I'm I'm seeing grass heights and and other cover characteristics right thinking about it from a wildlife perspective but if uh, I change hats and I'm a range uh, specialist or um, a rancher looking at this I'm seeing things like uh, pounds per acre forage uh, how that differs in the uplands versus the riparian and I'm um, thinking distance to water and water access points and all that kind of thing from from that uh, position and that's what I'm referring to as professional uh, or educational bias whatever we've come to this with is how we see these landscapes and the fact is is that although we may value this same landscape for different things this landscape provides all that it provides forage and it provides cover it provides uh you know riparian habitat for um you know maybe fish if there's enough water there or but also for uh cattle for to water and and meet their needs that way so um my point is is we should open ourselves up to that other side and recognize our own biases and i think that'll help especially when it comes to a topic like uh, treating sagebrush where depending on where you're coming from you may feel differently about sagebrush treatment projects we also have uh, what i'll just call a western cultural bias when it comes to sagebrush and this is still prevalent uh, with folks that i meet with today um, you know i look at the people across the west especially here in utah and where they came from you know, they, most of them came from uh, Scandinavia or the British Isles, and they first came to eastern United States. And when we think about those areas, um, we think about this kind of pasture land, right? This um, very highly productive, high pounds per acre of forage and high quality and, and lots of rain. And, and these folks came from this to this and and when you think about that you might almost feel bad for them you know that um where they came from but where they came from is is part of their bias right and and, and they're coming out here from places where there's uh highly renewable grasslands uh for for grazing uh, livestock and out here it's not that we don't have grass we have grass but it's just not as uh, many pounds per acre so it's productive um, and it takes uh, a different way of grazing to match this landscape and because I think partly where they came from and and landing here and and the idea that grass and uh, sagebrush compete with each other and the more sagebrush you can get rid of the more grass you can get uh, I think is part of this and so uh, we definitely have a Western bias to sagebrush treatments in that they're good and, and they help improve things for livestock and that kind of thing. And again, I'm, I'm speaking partly with what I've uh, seen as I've dealt with folks um, on the land or in their own private lands and that kind of thing. And, and that's, it is what it is, right, that we have that out here. Next, I want to talk about uh, the heterogeneity that we see in sagebrush systems because often I think we we like to think about sagebrush is sagebrush is sagebrush right and 
in, in a lot of ways, we try to simplify things to try to uh, have things make sense. I think that's a very human trait to do that. But in actuality, it's, it's even within Sagebrush, it's highly complex, right? And so uh, we need to think about that a little bit. And, and the first way I would, I would think about it is just subspecies of big Sagebrush. So at lower elevations, um, we have uh, Wyoming big sage. You're talking more generally more drier sites with less grass and forb uh, cover usually, and, and some of that's on a on an east to west um, right. When you're further east, you have more grass, and further west less, and then north and south as well. But uh, anyways. Um, Wyoming, and then you have this like mid elevation uh, um, basin big sage um, that kind of fits between Wyoming sagebrush and then also um, Bassiana or mountain big sagebrush that's at much higher elevations. And you can you can think about the these in in the climatic conditions that that they grow in just just in terms of precip. There's a vast difference between what mountain big sage deals with versus what uh, Wyoming big sage deals with. And that's part of how they respond to treatments and, and, and that kind of thing. And so that's that's one kind of first way to capture heterogeneity out there. And here's the values of average precips for these different community types here in the West. And you can see uh, there's a relationship between elevation and moisture moving up to the mountain. There's also these um, dwarf sagebrush, uh, black sage and low sage, and um, uh, there's a few others, but um, the ones that can dominate a landscape kind of thing uh, are, are, are these two that we see most often here in Utah. And uh, generally it's, it's a soils issue. You have uh, shallower soils and then um, these shrubs, uh, tend to dominate that area. And as far as treatment goes and these, um, usually that it's, it, it doesn't have potential to produce any sort of herbaceous response that you might desire, first of all. And, and, and then second of all, they don't respond, at least what we know right now, they don't respond all that well to treatment as far as uh, treatment recovery. So we have to be careful. Um, another way to think about the heterogeneity out there, and this is going a little bit beyond sagebrush per se, but uh, is is fire return intervals and what they've been naturally and what they are uh, now. So on the left we have uh, salt desert uh, and all the way up. So this is kind of moving up in elevation left to right uh, to the, uh, alpine forests. And, and you can just see, this is historic data, uh, of fire return intervals. And, and by the time we get to Wyoming big sage, we're in the 3,200 years of, of natural fire return. And as we move up into, uh, mountain big sage, uh, that fire return interval decreases quite a bit, actually. Uh, in, in some of the highest elevations um, of Mountain Big. And, and that that really helps us understand when it comes to treatments uh, where you're reducing sagebrush canopy cover, you know, what it's going to take to have that community respond, to um, to come back and, and restore itself, and, and, and the probabilities of that being able to happen um, uh, can be laid out, you know, across these fire return intervals, basically, where you have a much higher chance of a successful uh, project when you're dealing with more moisture at higher elevations, that kind of thing. And interestingly, um, our, <laughs> our fire return interval has been altered, right, in, in recent years. And we, we've pretty much done the inverse of this uh, across Western landscapes. And, and this last summer was a perfect example of how how that can really come back to bite us with all the fires across the West. Uh, and so, yeah, we have cheatgrass invasion at the lower elevation stuff that's up the return interval and uh, uh, suppression at the higher elevations.
I wanted to get into this a little bit with the resistance resilience. This comes out of uh, some of Chambers' um, work. Uh, but if you haven't been exposed to resistance resilience, I uh, encourage you to. I think it's a really neat concept for trying to understand some of our rangelands uh, here in the West. But basically, you know, resilience is how um, how quickly a vegetation community can bounce back from a disturbance. And resilience is how a community can resist, sorry, resistance is how it can resist uh, disturbance happening in the first place, right? And generally they go together. So um, higher r and values versus lower. And, and you can see how that spreads across this uh, same gradient of, of salt desert up to a mountain. Big stage with higher resistance resilience values at, at those higher elevations with more water. Okay, and so that's particularly interesting because we're this isn't we're not just talking about natural disturbance with treatments, but we're talking about an induced uh, uh, disturbance on that community. And with the higher R and R values, you can get the more uh, probability of of having a successful project. Um, I think it's important to kind of take a minute and talk a little bit about what keeps a sagebrush community in place and you know i think most of us would would think about a sagebrush community and say well it's dominated by sagebrush so sagebrush are the key to that community but if we if we think about that community in this disturbance context and and you know all communities were disturbed at some level it's just how frequently right and so what keeps that community in place in a sagebrush system is really the perennial grasses and what I mean by that is if you think about a situation, even, even at like low elevation Wyoming big stage in the Great Basin, right? That's inundated with cheatgrass. And uh, you know, if if a fire comes through and wipes out your sagebrush and all you have is cheatgrass left, the likelihood of getting a sagebrush community back is really low. But on the other hand, if you have a good perennial grass cover in that understory, then eventually, it might take a long time, but eventually a sagebrush community can return, right? And and you can get sagebrush back in that system. And that's that's this idea that perennial grasses are critically important to the response of a sagebrush community uh, to, to uh, be resilient and to uh, uh, come back over time. Just quickly, um, I'm sure we've all know a little bit about sage grass, but uh, I just wanted to cover this because it matters for the discussion. You know, we have our our uh, lek period here where the males go in and dance and display and do their thing. The females come in, get bred, go to a nest. This is a, a female underneath a sagebrush at her nest site. Uh, they produce these cute little um, uh, sage grouse fuzzy balls. Uh, and then they grow up into this kind of late broodering period. And uh, then we hit winter time uh, where sage grouse eat 100% of their diet is sagebrush. And then they're back to the lecking period. So the whole thing starts over again. What's of most important, I think, as it pertains to our discussion about sagebrush treatments is that in the nesting period and in the wintering period, sagebrush cover is critical and large amounts of sagebrush with high shrub canopy are really important to the birds at this time however when we move into the late brooding period which is this horizontally elongated so when these chicks are a little bit older and and they've grown up a little bit they they tend to seek out more open areas with higher grass and forb content partly because of the forbs that are there, but also because of the insects that are there that those, those chicks uh, need for their growth and survival. And so when we're thinking about sagebrush communities as they relate to sage-grouse habitat, seasonality is what matters the most and, and can help us as we try to think about how to do sagebrush treatments. Um, uh, within these different uh, seasonal habitat types and what might be at risk or what where do we have a little more play 
So one of the uh, biggest issues I've come across as a sage grouse biologist and trying to communicate uh, to folks is the scale at which sage grouse populations use landscapes. So um, I've done a little bit of research up in Wyoming, up near Pinedale, and uh, we have this large area in the uh, Green River Basin there and extending from Pinedale all the way down to I-80 and, and around. And that is basically one large population. <laughs> and grouse, not all grouse, but some grouse move across that entire landscape. Um, in a given year between their seasonal habitat types. And so you can, you can see, now this is one of the more stable, largest populations left, right, in, in the Western US, but it's precisely this large landscape context as to why that population is so stable and uh, large over time. And, and, and where we see sage grouse suffer the most, where they do not persist on the landscape, is where this uh, large contiguous sagebrush communities start to break up and fragment or degrade or wholesale conversion to ag or development or something like that. When that starts to break up, that's where sage grouse uh, persistence really drops out. And so, I'm not saying everywhere has to be this big and this intact, but to give us a good reference, this is probably the most intact largest uh, population area that's that's left. And so it, it can give us a nice reference as we think about other things. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, sage grouse and, and livestock response and some of the data we've collected and research over time as it pertains to sagebrush treatments. Uh, a lot of this work is with Dr. Mesmer and Dr. Dacker um, that I've collaborated with uh, over um, a couple decades now. Uh, so the first one I'm going to talk about is the Parker Mountain uh, area. Uh, we have the PARM or the, uh, the local working group that's down there and uh, it, it has this the yellow line there is what I'm going to call the outer perimeter of the Parker. Um, it grouse are actually bigger than that. Uh, they use areas that are outside of that, but that's kind of the core of it. And, and that's still a large area. Uh, the Parker Plateau uh, goes from about 7,000 feet all the way up to almost 10. Uh, that big uh, blue Sitla block in the middle is a, an important uh, piece uh, partly because that's where we've done a lot of this research and work and and having it be sitla ground allows us to do a lot of that without some of the uh, tangles that can happen with uh, within federal uh, land and so um, this is this is the Parker Mountain area more specifically so we started back in uh, 2000 and 2001 with these uh, smaller block treatments. So those blue blocks there are 100 acre blocks uh, that were laid out in the uh, Parker Lake pasture. And we laid the blocks out such that they gathered as much of the mountain big sage in that area as they can. However, each one of those blocks has quite a bit of black sage, uh, which are more on the hilltops. And um, we had 16 of them, and we were interested in sage first treatment methods to see how uh, the uh, community responded for and grass wise and also the sage grass responded now these areas uh, were considered high density uh, of sagebrush canopy cover that were was potentially limiting uh, understory grasses and forbs and so the, the the idea was to open that canopy up and allow more grasses and forbs the the key though going back to the seasonal habitat is that we knew that this area was a major brooding area uh, we'd done some telemetry work and, and we knew that that uh, while there's some nests in this area, it, it was more of a brooding area per se than a nesting area. Um, and so we, with these blocks, we did uh, four replicates. So we did four control areas where nothing happened. Uh, four tevithyron or spike, so chemical treatment. And then four Dixie Harrow, a, a two-way Dixie. 
and then four loss and aerator, a big drum aerator that crushes the sagebrush. And those treatment types were randomly assigned across these uh, blocks for our experimental design. From there, uh, and, and from the, some of that research, we we scaled up. You know, this is the adaptive management approach, right? Start small, scale up. And, and from what we learned, we moved into these bigger pastures at slightly higher elevations and uh, and did more treatment. And you can see, although we're not spatially replicated with these uh, bigger treatments, we, uh, we are replicated through time. So we did South Pasture in 2006, Nick's Pasture in 2007, Buttes in 10, Porsche in 2011, Chicken Springs in 2012. And then the yellow areas are places that didn't receive treatment. Okay, so that's kind of our experimental design uh, and, and our approach to this. Some of the data I'm going to share comes off of uh, Nate uh, Defon's uh, thesis with uh, his major professor, Dr. Thacker, and then some of my work uh, during graduate school down there. So in all these uh, areas, we did vegetation sampling where we looked at shrub cover, grass cover, forb cover. Um, originally, we, we had radio marked birds that we were hoping would use these areas and just by chance, they didn't. None of them did. <laughs> they went through it, around it, uh, never even came this direction. And so at first thought, we, well, maybe, maybe these, the whole thing was bad, right? But no, it, there was plenty of grouse using these areas. It's just that by chance, we didn't mark the ones that did. And so um, I came up with some alternative ways to look at how sage grouse would use these treatments. Uh, and this is specifically with the Parker Lake pasture, the 100 acre plots there. We did pellet counts and uh, pointing dog surveys to look at the grouse that we're using in that area. And then when we moved into the upper elevations, uh, Nate did um, uh, forage, so he did clip and weigh, but, and then he also did some of the vegetation sampling uh, and the forage was kind of, it was in association with that sample. So here's some of the, the, the data. Uh, Nate helped put this together. So my, my graduate work, we published it in 2006, and I think it extends, the data extends to 2004. And in this one, uh, Nate put some of this Parker Lake pasture, these 100 acre plots uh, data together uh, from 2000 to 2009, so 10 years of, of data. Um, and as you can see, this is just sagebrush cover and control there. Basically, it varies a little bit over time, but um, isn't overall isn't changing that much. And I keep that uh, in the next graphs. The black is just the control, and then the blue and red are the treatment type response in compared to the control. And so you can see with Dixie Harrow and Lost and Aerator, uh, there's that initial dip, and then they uh, come back in time. And basically, in this big sage, mountain big sage community, these these treatments were back to pre uh, pre treatment conditions in about five to ten years is is when they came back in in the Dixie and the Lawson. Tebby Thyron, we can still go out there, and I can show you areas that have not uh, fully come back yet, and and still have um, a, a treatment effect on them. And so uh not rocket science there at all but just yeah you treat stage worse and that's what's happened to the cover now this is a uh, grass cover response so we initially saw a dixie harrow a little bit of response and it came back to uh control loss narrator same thing a little bit of response and then back to control and but tabby tabby thyron we got a little, little bit different um it it didn't happen for a while but eventually um uh, it responded and, and had more grass cover than than the control. And, but here's where it gets really interesting um, when we look at forb cover. So Dixie Hero, we didn't get anything. Lost Area, we didn't get anything. Tebby Thyron, we got some, and then it, it separated itself and it hasn't, hasn't returned yet to uh, the control. Uh, and then more specifically, we took out those forb species that we knew grouse ate. So I went through the literature, got those four species, we pulled them out, and this is what it looks like. Dixie hair a little bit, lost area not much, but Tebby Thyron, when it comes to these, what we call grouse forbs, uh, completely increased and then stayed uh, and kind of went in a totally different direction uh, than the controls, uh, which 
we actually see this in the grouse use here in a second. So when we did uh, pellet clusters, uh, looking at um, uh, the density of pellets on that landscape within those plots, spike by far uh, had more, uh, double or more from control or the two uh, mechanicals and uh, was the only one that was uh, statistically different. Um, when we looked at bird dogs, we got a very uh, similar uh, data response. So this is proportion of birds flushed in those plots. This is during the brooding period in, in late July and um, proportionally by far spike is outperforming uh, the other three. Uh, maybe a little bit of initial response from the, the mechanicals, but uh, e even with that, the spike is doing quite a bit better. One interesting thing from the pellets and maybe even a little bit from the flush counts uh, is, but this was measured from the pellets, is we, we measure when we got a pellet cluster, we measured the distance from that cluster to edge. So if it was a cluster in a treatment, then it was back to where's the nearest intact sagebrush. If it was a cluster in intact sagebrush, then to that treatment line or some other break in the community. So if it changed from big sage to black sage or something, then that's the distance we measured. And what we found was that most pellets, the vast majority of pellets were within 30 meters of an edge. And so the takeaway there is, is while the grouse preferred the treatment areas and, and the forb response, they also didn't want to be too far away from intact sagebrush. When they were in intact sagebrush, they didn't want to be too far away from those food resources either. So there's kind of a, a balance there and that can help us as we design treatments in the future. Moving up into the higher elevation pastures, um, uh, so this was data uh, taken in 2014-15 um, with these, these, so these are going back to those different pastures, those bigger elevation pastures, and looking at grass and forbs, forbs in the orange, grasses in the green. And you can see that the same pattern pretty much is, is here throughout. The oldest treatment is in 2000 and uh, I think it was 2006 was South Pasture and the newest treatment was Chicken Springs. Um, and you can see a response by forbs and grasses to that treatment. Uh, the stars represent statistical significance, or it was, we know it was different. And, and you can see that in Nix for Shea and, and Chicken when it comes to grass. Uh, buttes, we didn't, it's, it's more in the treated area than the, than an untreated area, but it wasn't different statistically. And, and the buttes had a shallower soil. Uh, and we think that's part of why it just didn't have the soil type that would allow uh, that grass response to really shoot up uh, like it, some of the other pastures. Have. When we looked at uh, grouse uh, use in those areas, again, this is, uh, this is data from 2014 and 15 with, uh, in, during the brooding period. You can see that uh, those different colors are the different years uh, and the all the, you know, Buttes, Chicken, Forche, Nix, and South, those are all treated areas. And then I combined all the reference areas there on the right. And so just total number of grouse that we flush per kilometer transect, the, the spiked areas are well outperforming the control or the reference areas that where nothing can happen. Moving on to a project we did on desert land livestock. So this is up in Northern Utah on the wild border. There we look, so we wanted to understand what was going on on a very large time scale across a very large landscape. And the way we did that is we looked at, uh, first of all, we looked at let counts on desert land livestock. That's the perimeter that you see the outline there. And then we looked at those leks in comparison to leks to the north in, in, in Utah, or what we call the rich leks, uh, rich county leks. And those are primarily on BLM land. And then we compared that to the Wyoming lex, which are also primarily on BLM land, but on the Wyoming side. We also looked at brood counts and, and within desert land livestock, we looked at uh, sage grass use of treatment areas. So how it all differed on DLL, we have high intensity, low duration grazing. Uh, so this started back in the eighties and uh, they're basically building rest in that system. So 20 to 30 percent of those pastures are rested annually. The uh, stocking rate is actually nearly twice what it is on the BLM areas in Rich County in Wyoming. Uh, 
importantly, in, in the mid 90s, DLL started to do habitat treatments um, of d various kinds, Lawson aerator, uh, they did some mowing, uh, eventually they did spike and some fire and some of their higher elevations. But uh, about 1.5% of the ranch was treated per year. So in the end, when they stopped doing treatments, they had about 15% of the sage grouse area that got treated. Uh, for Rich County, they had, and Wyoming both, they had season long or simple rotation grazing. And uh, I mentioned the stocking rate was uh, about half of what it is on TLO. And then uh, less than 2% in Rich County was treated at this time and less than 8% in Wyoming. And most of the Wyoming stuff was a wildfire that, that came through. So what we saw in let counts, you can see the at the beginning in the late 80s to the mid 90s, all the populations are tracking together in this area. DLL in instituted their some of their sage horse treatments uh, in in these areas, and boom, the the sage horse population took off, and nearly doubled what it the density of birds or males on lex uh, in the other two areas, and stayed high for uh, higher for over a decade. Uh, but then in you know 2010-11, we got some of the worst winter storms during the spring and. We just saw a crash in, in sage grouse up there in that area. And, and they all crashed together and they all crashed at the same time. And, uh, and so, you know, that weather component, you know, in, in, in average years, you know, that management on DLL seemed to be really helping the sage grouse. But when you get those overriding climatic uh, events, it can, topple whatever good management you're doing and, and we know that in drought we know that in in uh, if we get you know too much uh, snowpack for uh, certain wildlife so that's that's the first look at what's going on in that area we did look at, at, at broods and uh, they did brood counts from 97 to 2001 uh, they were doing them uh, Rick Danver was doing them on DLL and uh, the biologist uh, when the DWR used to have uh, up on game biologists in the region uh, uh, they were doing it uh, up there on the BLM site so just a few miles away uh, from where uh, from the DLL area but you can see chicks per brood on DLL was about twice what it was on the BLM side and so there was definitely um, some production that was going on on DLL that wasn't necessarily going on uh, on those BLM areas and in the and the data shows that So as far as sage treatments go that, that happened on DLL, this is, you know, I, I said there was a variety of different treatment types. Um, and what we're looking at there is, uh, looks like to me, a loss narrator or a mowing. Um, but importantly, so this graph here shows treatment frequency by elevation in color. And then by across that X axis by uh, size of treated area per treatment. So you can see that the vast majority of treatments during this time were smaller treatments that were primarily happening at mid to high elevations and a lot of the low areas and large treatments just weren't uh, taking place. And so that's very important uh, to the story of, of sage grouse and, and sage grouse habitat. Um, now DLI wasn't doing this for sage grouse, they were doing it for livestock forage improvements, right? But this is how uh, sage grouse responded and they certainly were trying to keep sage grouse in mind as they were doing these things. Um, when we looked at flush counts, um, we again saw more birds in treated areas than we saw in intact control areas, reference areas, but just as importantly is our, our data almost matched perfectly with the Parker stuff in that the birds just we kept track of where they flushed and they just didn't want to be that far away from intact sagebrush when they're in the treatment. Um, and so, you know, again, 30 meters, 30 to 50, probably at the, at the most is where they, they desire to be. And so that was really interesting and neat to see that those two came together. The take home here, high elevation mountain big sagebrush. Um, we found that spike gave us the best results in these areas and that the grouse preferred that. Now the spike that we did was kind of a, 
mid to low active ingredient. So we weren't getting like full on kill of all the sagebrush. It was some areas it would kill down for an acre or two, but then they kind of had this, what we call like a feather effect where some sagebrush or parts of sagebrush plants would die, others would stay alive. And some areas that I'm assuming were just really deep soil, just hardly seemed affected at all by it. Um, and so you, you just had this really off and on kind of treatment effect on there and the grouse really seemed to like that. Um, one thing that spike offers is it'll, it keeps these sagebrush skeletons in place, both above ground, which can catch more snow and below ground, which can take up root space, right? And so uh, from that, we get these more ameliorated environments, these micro environments. And in those environments is where we see more of these grouse forbs, these succulent forbs, dandelion, false dandelion, uh, that kind of thing that, that the grouse really are, are attracted to. And so that's one of the other benefits of the, of the spike. <clears throat> If we are going to do mechanical treatments, if that's decided as what's best for the project, then if we're in sage grouse habitat, we're suggesting keep those, you know, distance between uh, treatment and intact stage under 120 meters, maybe even less, and then put in a mosaic design, create create edge out there so that because we know that those birds are responding to that edge. And then the spatial and temporal scale matter to match the sagebrush type or, or this resistance resilience idea. If, if you're in lower elevation stuff, it may take 20 years, 30 years, 40 years for for that community to re come back uh, versus mountain big sage where we were seeing stuff as, you know, as early as five to seven years, the sagebrush was near back to pre-treatment levels. And so um, matching spatial and temporal scales matters when we, when we talk about uh, treatments across that landscape. We know that in nesting and wintering habitat, if we treat too much, it will be detrimental to sage grouse. That's that's been shown in the past, um, long before sage grouse were much of a conservation issue uh, that was being seen. And so we have to be really cautious about how we move forward when we're dealing with winter or nesting habitat and the percentage of that landscape we're taking. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, we did see a forage increase. Most of that happened in some of the deeper soil, more bang for our buck. And we also encourage the adaptive management process as you're doing these things. There's there's different conditions out there and, and all these different landscapes and start small and build up. Um, use that adaptive management process uh, and I, I, it'll be very helpful and you can make course corrections as needed. I think it's important. Uh, um, I think f from a wildlife, going back to the professional bias stuff, from a wildlife perspective, we're, we're mostly uh, concerned with habitat structure, height, canopy cover, uh, that kind of thing. For, whereas from a range perspective, they're more tuned into the nutritional uh, effects, you know, that, that, that new growth and, and what, what's the protein content and, blah, and all those kinds of things, right? So we need more of a balance between these two approaches because sage grouse need nutrition, but they also need cover. Cattle need nutrition for sure, but without the right cover types, that community may not last very long, right? And that would destabilize that area and may affect future grazing possibilities. So there's, it, it just needs to be a balance there. Um, Late broodering habitat, where the grouse are seeking more mesic, more open areas with more uh, grasses and forbs, that's where we see the most win-win situation possible, is is in those higher elevations and and that late breeding habitat. So think about that. Um, now now you can be in brooding habitat and nesting habitat. That area can cover both, or and winter habitat, or all three, right? And so. You have to be careful about that seasonal overlap issue, but that's um, that's where we have more room, uh, both uh, from a, a spatial scale and and if we're in high elevations, uh, a temporal scale that we can we can do it more often um, in, in those kinds of areas. Uh, one of the things that's neat about that, especially that DLL stuff is that we were able to show an actual increase in the sage grass population uh, from, from that management. And so uh, that's been 
almost unheard of <laughs> to to have increasing populations at least at least for almost you know almost 15 years. So uh, that was that was really cool to see. So I want to get into uh, some of our current knowledge and how this might apply to future sagebrush treatments. And what I've developed here, uh, and this is in association with uh, Dr. Thacker as well, but what, what we've come up with is what I'm going to call the one quarter, one half, two thirds rule. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. So let's say you have this landscape and in the middle of it is a lek, right? And there's a certain buffer distance here from the lek to this outer circle. So from I'm basing this on some of the other literature that's been done, but we're dealing with anywhere from, I think it's 18 kilometers up to 31 kilometers, right? So a big area, right? A radius of 18 to 31 kilometers. So given that area, if 25% or less of that area is dominated by sagebrush, so only 25% or less has sagebrush as, as the dominant uh, cover type, then that sage grouse population is no longer there. It did not persist. When we go 25% of that landscape, so I'm not talking about sagebrush canopy cover, I'm talking about percentage of a landscape. If 25 to 50% of that landscape is dominated by sagebrush, then you have a varying degrees of probability of persistence for that lek. So the closer you get to 25%, the higher probability, the, the lower probability of persistence, higher probability of losing the lek. And the closer you get to 50, the higher probability of persistence of that, of that lek. Okay. When you move from 50 to two thirds, so 66% of that landscape being dominated by sagebrush, you're moving into the probability of one that basically the, the probability of persistence is super, super high. Okay. And once you go over that, then, then you, you it's one, you're going to have your, that lek is going to persist over time. Okay. So that's the first thing to consider. Second, this is uh, some of the resistance resilience mapping that's available. And there's the website on the Sage Grouse Initiative. You can go and you download this and, and use it in your ARC map. And, and so you can actually look at these categories of low, moderate, and high resistance resilience values. And it just helps you understand your project area and, and where it's landing and, and the probability. So for example, if you're in extremely low uh, resistance resilience, the probability of that sagebrush treatment getting to the objectives you want and, and eventually uh, restoring or, or coming back, uh, it's really low, right? And so we just caution is advised and, and we, we need to be a lot more careful versus moving into high resistance resilience areas. So with, with the permission of uh, BLM biologists at Down in Richfield, um, this is a proposed project area that they sent me in that I kind of develop this tool around to try to show you things that we might consider. Okay. So I'm going to go back through some of the stuff that we just talked about. So the first issue is, is it in a sage grouse management area? Is it in the, one of these conservation priority areas that's been designated for sage grouse? And that's the yellow line. And yes, this project area uh, fits in that uh, sage grouse management area. Okay. So that's the first one. What's the seasonal habitat type? So this is some uh, data modeling that we've done at USU to designate seasonal habitat type. And uh, all these colors represent different uh, habitats. So, and I, I tried to use the color wheel here. So uh, if it's brown, it's all three. It's winter habitat, brooding habitat, and nesting habitat. Uh, and then based on the different colors is the combinations of the other. Blue is just straight winter habitat. Uh, red is uh, winter and nesting, and that's where you get the purple. And uh, green is, let's see, nesting and brooding, I believe. So that's the combination there. And, but we can look and see that we have a little bit of winter. We have a, a good amount of nesting habitat in that area that's overlapped with either everything or with uh, the winter habitat. Okay. Here's the resistance resilience mapping in this area. 
and you can see, so green is high, yellow is moderate, uh, and so you can see that most of this area is high, and about a third of it is moderate. So at least we're dealing with a, a higher resistance resilience values in these areas. So this is the landscape. So I chose a 31 kilometer buffer around the lake. So I went to the nearest lake, just north of that pr uh, project area, and 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 did a I did buffers around all the lakes, but that's we're mainly looking at the buffer just around this uh, lake that's closest. Okay, and so as you can see, that's a big area. It goes all the way up to Salina and uh, down to Monroe and uh, Kasherm and Greenwich and around Fish Lake and so on. So I I used GAP to get uh, the different sagebrush that occurs in this area, and all that green area is mapped uh, sagebrush. Okay, so how much of that landscape right there is dominated by sagebrush? And when we when we look at that, uh, about 40% of that area is uh, dominated by sagebrush. So that's that's in that 25 to 50% range, right? Where where we have variable probability persistence, and that's very true for this lek. This lek is small and somewhat ephemeral some years there's birds there some years there's not and it's been a hard luck to keep track of and so it, it fits that definition of uh based of probability persistence based on that percent of dominate sagebrush uh landscape okay so we know it's in an sgma we know what kind of seasonal habitat we're dealing with we know what the resistance resilience value is and we know we're on that edge there of sagebrush cover so we're being more cautious with this area um, we're dealing with winter and we're dealing with nesting habitat so we need to be that much more cautious but we're dealing with higher resist r and r values right and we know that we have to account for stage grass because we're within an SGA. so lastly i've just come up with like a little bit of a decision tree you know what's if you're going to do sagebrush treatments with sage grass in mind What's limiting the population? Is it herbaceous cover? It, do we have brooding issues, pre-laying issues where we need more forbs in the landscape? Then proceed. But if it's something else, maybe we don't treat or maybe we make sure that we're treating less than 20% of some area because because um, we we don't, it may be sagebrush that's actually limiting our population and that we're proposing to reduce sagebrush. So we have to be more careful. What's the seasonal habitat type? Are we in nesting winter? Are we in some overlap? Are we in late, mostly late brooding? So if you're primarily in winter or nesting, then again, maybe consider not treating or uh, treating at a very a much smaller scale. Uh, seasonal overlap, you know, if, if, if we include some uh, brooding with winter or nesting, then I'm not saying don't move forward, but but maintaining sagebrush cover is highly important versus if we're primarily in late brooding habitat, you know, we can, we can uh, treat quite a bit of that area still in a mosaic design, but uh, there's a lot more potential and possibility there. And then take into account uh, the R and R values. And then whether you decide to go chemical or mechanical and what treatment rate, if you go chemical and that kind of thing is important. Most importantly is maintaining this overall landscape over 50% sagebrush cover and 65% uh, and is even better. And then thinking about cheatgrass, which uh, once you, you know, cheatgrass blows everything up, right? But uh, it needs to be considered as you're considering treatments because you, what you don't want to do is be expanding cheatgrass in, in sagegrass habitat and increasing fire potential and loss of that habitat. There's one exception to all this that uh, we probably ought to cover, and that's when we're dealing with sagebrush at low elevations. So we're in low R and R, we're in Wyoming big sage, we're in low precip, but all we have left is a cheatgrass understory. This situation here is is interesting. We've lost our perennial grass cover, so if a fire does happen, we're going to lose it, and we're, that sagebrush community, we're not getting it back. Is, is this sagegrass habitat as it is right here? Yes, it is. It, it, sagegrass could easily winter there um, and, and make it because all they really care about is the sagebrush cover and then the food that the sagebrush provides. We're not 
really caring about grasses and forbs at that point. Okay, so it is sage grouse habitat. But what's the probability that this area is going to be sage grouse habitat? The probability that it's going to be sage grouse habitat in five years is, is fairly good. The probability that's going to be sage grouse habitat in 20 years is not good. The probability that it's going to burn is really high. So getting back to the perennial grasses and what causes sage uh, communities to persist, we have to think about getting perennial grasses back in these areas. Right now, I don't know any other way to do that but then through sagebrush canopy reduction and seeding. There's certainly some methods that disturb that sagebrush canopy less, but that sagebrush canopy is going to be disturbed if we want to get perennials back in there. And so considering things like cheatgrass uh, control with, with plateau or something like that, and then a mechanical treatment to get perennial grasses going again, uh, in this situation here, I think it's worth the risk to start considering this. Now, once I say that, then we have to go to the discussion of spatial and temporal scales, right? So at what spatial scale do we try to restore that at? And I would suggest not doing more than 20% of, of that area, whatever we define that area as, as, uh, as true that the sagebrush canopy is treated and then not moving on to the next treatment until we get some of that sagebrush canopy back and then we can do the next one so this might take a while i i'm not i'm not saying anything quick and easy there's nothing quick and easy about cheatgrass issues and sagebrush but um this is something we can't just stick our heads in the sand and think that this is going to be sagegrass habitat in the future because it won't and with that, uh, there's lots and lots of uh, folks, many of you who are listening to this, um, that are partners on this and that have helped this research out uh, over all these years. And we are very uh, grateful and indebted to you for that support. And uh, with that, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I'm always willing to talk about these issues. If you're interested in that spatial tool that I presented that looks at those uh, different, uh, you know, is it an SGMA? What are our value? What's the sagebrush cover around that area? What's the habitat, seasonal habitat type in that area? Um, I'm more than willing to uh, work with you on those kinds of uh, projects or proposals for projects uh, for sagebrush canopy reduction so that uh, we can get the best information possible uh, for our sagebrush conservation uh, here in the state of Utah. And with that, I'll and